Okay, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the Sabbath and for the time that we have had so far this morning in sharing together the things that you have taught us and that you are showing us and folding to us from your word. And we just ask for your Holy Spirit to be here again as we we look at the crisis ahead. Uh, this study, Lord, that uh, we did in the upper room so long ago, we ask, Lord, that uh, and that we can see in it the things that you want to teach us and that we can continue on this path that you have set for our feet. Be with each person. May your Holy Spirit work upon their hearts. May your angels watch over them. And uh, may this Sabbath indeed be a blessing. And that we pray that we can be a blessing to others. Be with us now, we pray and ask, by thy spirit and in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Happy Sabbath. And uh, so originally I had thought that I had more to do with uh, the symbolic use of numbers. But as I went through the last presentation that I did on May 18th, I realized I had actually wrapped up the symbolic use of numbers. So I, I did want to do this study here from uh, uh, Robert Olson. He was uh, worked at the LNG White Estates. Um, and this was put together in 1970. It's just a compilation, Bell and White's writings. And uh, it was a real blessing to me back in, um, well, so this one was reprinted September 1989. So the one that I had was uh, obviously before that, because this was like 1985 that we studied this. Could have been early 86, um, because we had the upper room when I was there was from uh, April 20th, 1985, uh, the day after my son Micah was born, born, which is how I know the date. And then... Uh, when I left in May of uh, 1986, went to British Columbia and, and Kelly's kept the living there and, and the upper room studies in the attic of our house continued until um, probably another year, maybe. I'm not sure when they, when they ended because uh, I wasn't there, but uh, they continued for a while. Likely. Likely 1987, uh, the spring or whatever, summer of 1987, because I was married July 1st, 1987, and moved to Medicine Hat, moved out of the house. So that's when, okay, so July of 1987. What what date did you get well, married? I'm, July 1st. So July 1st. Um, okay. I, we chose July 1st, so it would be a holiday for our anniversary. And easy for husbands to remember. Canada do it, it for you yeah. know those Canadians a, cel uh, a celebration yeah a celebration of our marriage every year with fireworks <laughs> okay but yeah it's like, it's like yeah, my mom it was and, August when I moved out of the house. yeah my mom and dad got married on Remembrance Day my dad said so that he wouldn't forget his anniversary but I think at that time it was called Armistice Day but uh, so it's probably more uh, apocryphal, his uh, account. But anyway, we're going to read this here. So Robert Olson puts this together that he had put this compilation uh, for Gift of Prophecy class at Pacific Union College. And and these these this collection is, you know, at that time, a lot of these statements weren't necessarily accessible to everyone. And putting them together into this compilation was, you know, obviously pretty important in 1970. And then he gives all the chapters and all the different stuff here, but we're just gonna start reading through. Now it's done in a, in a, a question and answer, a format, which which is kind of nice, um, sort of how we you know often have Bible studies done. You have a question, then you have uh, this reference. And so we're gonna take our time and go through this. And, and see where it leads us as far as uh, discussion. But obviously back in 1985 or 86, that was before the time of the end, and that was before 9-11. And, and he's going to uh, quote 9-11 here on this page, Testimonies 9-11. 
So we can see a lot of things now that we wouldn't have been able to see then. The main thing I got from this book that I, that I remember about it was uh, some statements in the spirit of prophecy regarding how God's going to take the work into his own hands, uh, that it's not going to be man's machinery that's going to accomplish the work. Um, so as a young man, I was very impressed with how uh, God is going to accomplish this work, that it's that many people were looking to the church to accomplish it as an organization. And uh, what Ellen White says is that this is really a God accomplishing it. Um, you know, that we go from home to home with our Bible in our hands, our faces lighted up. I remember that statement. Now, the other one I also remember from here had to do with Satan's personation of Christ. And generally within Adventism, people have the idea that Satan's personation of Christ occurs before the close of probation. And he presents that 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 view exists and also the idea that Satan's personation of Christ occurs after the close of probation, which is really clear in the spirit of prophecy. I'm not sure specifically why Adventists would not accept what Ellen White says about it. Uh, I think it's probably be because it says would deceive if possible the very elect and they misunderstand that verse because it, it's they think, well, that means they must be able to be deceived. But the, it's actually a rhetorical statement to deceive if possible the very elect. The idea is that it's not possible to deceive the very elect. So so it's just a misunderstanding that's kind of crept into Adventism. But, and I and I think it's an important point. So those are the things I remember about this. But there's obviously a lot more than those two things. Uh, but those are the things that had the impressions on, on me at the time. Um, so the first question, what indications are there in Scripture that a terrible time of trouble lies ahead, ahead of us? Now, of course, we're going to have Daniel 12, verse 1. And um, we should all be familiar with Daniel 12.1 um, because we've been studying Daniel's last vision. But we know this is when Michael stands up. So in, in this context, this would be the close of probation. And so we know after the close of probation, there is this time of trouble, uh, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, everyone that should be found written in the book. Right. So so that time of trouble, it, there's obviously a time of trouble that precedes that precede, precedes the close of probation. Now, of course, uh, we have uh, some other verses here. Revelation 14. Um, and of course, people can feel free to comment at any time. Right. So we know Revelation 14, 9, that's going to be the third angel's message. And, and that one's going to have addressed to it. Um, this warning about receiving the mark of the beast and um, and then the punishment that's going to come, that they shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, right? And all this tormenting that's going to occur that some, you know, Christians take as, you know, evidence of an eternally burning hell because the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. Um, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. But we know that that's there's the book of Revelation is written in symbols and the smoke ascending up forever and ever has to do with the final eradication of sinners, that it's eternal. Um, and then we got Revelation 16. I don't think we need to read all of that. That's going to be the seven last plagues. So, of course. That's going to, again, be after the close of probation. And uh, we take the sixth plague, which is, uh, you know, the three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. That This sixth plague is going to be when Satan's personation of Christ occurs. So um, and again, that's in symbolic language. We're not looking for actual frogs and dragons and beasts and so forth, right? We know that it's it's symbolic of these religious systems. And then he refers us. Uh, so that's talking about the judgments upon the wicked. 
right? Or, um, but of course, the righteous go through the time of trouble. Now, Revelation 13, verse 15 to 17, he has. So um, I'm not sure. So he says, for the righteous. Um, and he doeth great wonders so that, that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them, that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the beast, the image of the beast should be killed. So this is referring to uh, the persecution that's going to occur under the Sunday law. So that would be a time of trouble. So a any thoughts on that? I mean, this is, is obviously review. There's nothing new here. Uh, we would all be familiar with this. So we're going to look at some spirit of prophecy quotes, how Mrs. White describes the, the period of distress that is coming. On Theo, Theo. Theodore, may I please yeah. ask a question? This is Kathy, Keith Swat, Williams' wife. Yeah. If the close of probation happens before this imitation Christ comes through and everything, um, how are there others that can be saved if we've, we've done this? Also, how is it possible that we won't have to suffer through the seven plagues? Um, that because the Israelites suffered just as much, well, maybe not as much as the Egyptians did. I don't know. I'm just really confused on that concept. Okay, um, so, so you, you, you asked a few different questions. So first, we have Satan's personation of Christ. Um, yes. Is just the, the crowning act in his deception. That is, after probation has closed, God, well, God declares the righteous as righteous, that they're not going to depart from their righteousness, and the wicked is wicked, they're not going to depart from their wickedness, right? So we know that God has now taken those two classes. They've already gone through a period of trouble, right? There's going to be the Sunday law crisis. There's going to be, uh, you know, the, the martyrs that are killed and so forth. And, well, and all man. kinds of exceptions prior to the close of probation. So when the people's probation closes, it closes because they have made their, their final decision. And God has judged the heart. So you have the close of probation, Michael standing up. Now you're going to have the seven last plagues poured out. Now, the seven last plagues, um, you know, we know that it says that the plague shall not come nigh thy dwelling. That is, these are primarily poured out upon the wicked. But it doesn't mean it's not a, a, a trial for the righteous. So one of the things that we see, especially when you get to the sixth plague, Satan's personation of Christ in the time of Jacob's trouble, is that for the righteous, it will appear as if they are the wicked, that, um, that, they they see themselves as sinners. Their sins have gone beforehand to judgment and they've been blotted out. And all they can do is, like Jacob, cling to Christ, right? I will okay. not go unless thou bless me, right? That's what yes. Jacob does. So that time of Jacob's trouble, that wrestling with Christ, um, is is the is it is definitely a trial. We can't say what happened to Jacob was not a trial. But true trial is is one that's more internal. It's not so much the events that are happening that are the trial to the righteous. Now, does that answer all of your questions or is there more? I wonder, my question is, my brother-in-law, he understands what we had witnessed before to him and my sister. And he's seen the things that we've said that were going to come to pass. And he recognizes that. But. When the close of probation comes, <clears throat> because my sister and brother-in-law have come to Christ more so than what they were several years ago. Mm -hmm. They pray and they seek and they do read the Bible. Is it that we need to continue to pray for them and that they'll make it through the close of probation and that they will be found righteous, even though they don't follow the Sabbath? Well, but they I believe some of our truths. Well, so yeah, we pray for everyone. I mean, we have to pray for ourselves. I mean, we, 
uh, to go through that time. I don't know, uh, you know, who's going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. I mean, those that are going to be alive when Christ returns. But right, the set that the mark of the beast is not until a certain time, right? So right now, the, the Sunday is not the mark of the beast. So God knows the heart. He knows when a person is approaching him and seeking to do what's right. Um, obviously, if it comes to the time when the Sabbath is proclaimed more fully and it, it's brought as the test, then they will, if they are following God, they will keep the seventh day Sabbath and they will reject the Sunday law. So, you know, none of us are a finished product. Uh, God is still working on each one of us. Just because we happen to be keeping the Sabbath now doesn't mean that we are safe. And and just because somebody isn't keeping the Sabbath, it doesn't mean they're lost. Even if their probation clock closes in death, right? So they could die before the Sunday law crisis arises and, and they're, they die as Sunday keepers. They would still be saved if God has judged that they are um, going to be secure in his kingdom. Okay. So, gotcha. So, Thank you. So, okay. okay. Thank you very much. Well, okay. Well, I'm glad that that helped. <laughs> it's yes. the best way to do it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I uh, posted a, a few uh, references there on the plagues that were really helpful. Yeah, I could yeah. share them or you could read them. <laughs> oh, well, well, we're going to run into these things, right? So, you know, well, let's let's stick with this compilation. I mean, I'm just referencing them now, but we'll we will run into this as we go through these studies. But uh, okay, I just just quickly though, just yeah, to answer the sister's question a little. Protection of the sealed. While the wicked are dying from hunger and pestilence. Angels will shield the righteous and supply their wants. To him who walketh righteously is a promise. Bread shall be given him, his water shall be sure. When the poor and needy seek water, there is none, and their tongue faileth for thirst. I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. In that day, multitudes will desire the shelter of God's mercy, which they have so long despised. Behold, the day comes saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but the hearing of the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. That's interesting. Wander from the north even to the east. So they're looking to uh, the papacy, or Rome, and spiritualism. Islam. Islam. Islam, yeah. 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 Okay. So lots in there. Okay, thanks, Kelly. Um, so this part here, the last great crisis, um, uh, is the, the heading. Okay, so Ellen White says, uh, or even before that, I guess the terrible crisis, we didn't read that, from Evangelism 31 and 5 Testimonies 463. Uh, the work which the church has failed to do in a time of peace and prosperity, she will have to do in a terrible crisis under the most discouraging, forbidding circumstances. Right. So we know that there's a terrible crisis that, that's happening. And of course, the church often has failed to do the work when they have the opportunity. So we're going to have to do it in much more difficult times. Um, so the last great crisis in this time of prevailing iniquity, we may know that the last great crisis is at hand when the defiance of God's law is almost universal. When his people are oppressed and afflicted by their fellow man, the Lord will interpose. So Christ object, object lessons 178. Now, so I always keep referring back to when I first, you know, read this compilation and and the impressions it had upon me so one is uh you know ellen white's writing from a long time ago and and definitely the prevailing iniquity in her day when we could try to compare it to the 1990s or the 1980s you know when i'm first an adventist um 
we, we knew that things are going to get worse and, and they have gotten worse very quickly in this world. You know, many of us older people, we long for the 1970s when the world was much more simpler and it, you know, we knew what a man and a woman were, right? So we, we live in this time of utter confusion. And, and even if you look at uh, politics of today compared to the past, I mean, to me, it's insane what we see happening in the United States. I mean, nobody would have put up with something so silly uh, in the 1970s. You know, a president, you know, with a sort of a mock trial and or an ex-president and and all, all of the stuff that has gone on that has just grown and developed. And of course, what we see within Christianity itself, what we see within the Adventist church, we could hardly have imagined it back in the 1980s, right? So this idea of prevailing iniquity in Ellen White's day, we would say, well. Sorry for and, the delay. What's that? Uh, I, sorry for the delay, longing for the 70s. I longed for the 60s when I was eight years old, getting on a city transit bus by myself, just riding around the road. Nobody asked me where my mom or dad was or going downtown to the CN Tower, playing down the escalators into the train station. I mean, those were good days, very yeah. innocent and simple and, and yeah. safe. <laughs> but yeah, the contrast is dark. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so we can see that the world is definitely much, uh, it's prevailing iniquity. Iniquity has abounded more and more. And then we have the statement, the calamities by land and sea, the unsettled state of society, the alarms of the war are portentous. They forecast approaching events of the greatest magnitude. The agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating. They are strengthening for the last great crisis. Great changes are soon to take place in our world, and the final movements will be rapid ones. Now, of course, we know this is from Nine Testimonies, page 11. And uh, this is, uh, you know, when when 9-11 occurred, uh, that's one of the first places I turned was to this chapter called The Last Crisis. Right. Right. So that that whole section there of 9-11, starting at 9-11, going through page 12, 13, so, et cetera, you're going to have uh, the destruction of the great buildings of New York, right? Which really are the twin towers, right? Ellen White talks about this vision. And, and we can see that what she's describing in this, this last crisis is the crisis that we are in presently. Um, you know, men consolidating all these different types of things. Um, right. So this, uh, here, just to read a bit more of this, um, the condition of things in the world shows that troublous times are right upon us. The daily papers are full of indications of terrible conflict in the near future. Um, bold robberies are a frequent occurrence. Strikes are common. Thefts of murders are committed on every hand. Men possessed of demons are taking the lives of men, women, and little children. Men have become infatuated with vice, and every species of evil prevails. Right Now, we know that Ellen White is a prophet when she talks about things in her time she's actually speaking about our time right that that the prophet even though she's talking about her time in the context she's really talking about our time she's talking about the end of the world uh, because it's more true of our time than it is of hers okay the most momentous struggle of the ages. A great crisis awaits the people of God. A crisis awaits the world. The most momentous struggle of all ages is just before us. 5T, 711. Uh, another one from Prophets and Kings, 278. We are standing on the threshold of the crisis of the ages. In quick succession, the judgments of God will follow one another, fire and flood and earthquake, with war and bloodshed. We are not to be surprised at this time by events both great and decisive. For the angel of mercy cannot remain much longer to shelter the impenitent. So when she says we're standing on the threshold of the crisis of the ages, I mean, it's true in her day, but it didn't occur 
it, you know, completely in her day. Now we know this fire, flood, earthquake, war, bloodshed, all these things have been progressively getting worse. She says, uh, we are coming to a crisis which, more than any previous time since the world began, will demand the entire consecration of everyone who has named the name of Christ. So often we we hope that these crises are averted and that we don't have to actually have entire consecration. Um, often people want to put off these events because they're not ready. But now is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time, right? Now is when we need to turn to Christ and, and make an entire consecration because we are in the midst of this crisis. Um, the present is a time of overwhelming interest to all living. Rulers and statesmen, men who occupy positions of trust and authority, thinking men and women of all classes, have their attention fixed upon the events taking place about us, right? So we know that this is true. Uh, we can see this clearly on YouTube. If you're going to uh, go to YouTube and look at any sort of uh, discussions that are happening, people know something is happening. And we see this movement, um, all of these people becoming Christians, these YouTube celebrities, uh, you know, people who have become celebrities like Ian, that uh, black lady who was a Muslim and then an atheist and now has become a Christian. Of course, uh, Michaela Peterson has become a Protestant. Um, and, uh, you know, Russell yeah. Brand getting baptized, all kinds of uh, different things happening and discussion. Even people who aren't Christians still seeing that this world is in bad shape. Yeah. Kelly? Uh, Zach, Zach Wild used to play for Ozzy Osbourne. Yeah. He became a Christian. And the other one was, uh, we think of Alice Cooper. Now, those are quasi Christians, but. And Zach Wild is Roman Catholic. He became Roman Catholic. Lots of people are becoming Catholic. Orthodox, Orthodox is becoming popular um, as well mm -hmm. for some people. But I thought it was interesting that with Jordan Peterson, his wife became a Catholic, but his daughter became a Protestant. You know, that is interesting. I didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah. and and her recent someone video, got to send him the interesting. Someone has to send yeah. him the great controversy a nice nice copy of it. Maybe I will. Yeah. Maybe yeah. he has five of them already. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I don't know if it's easy to get stuff to him, but um, but anyway, um, you know, they're, they're, you know, when you got millions of people watching you, uh, I mean, I would I would try to focus more on Michaela Peterson just because she doesn't have as big a following and much more chance that she might um, be able to to read the Who's book. Who's a radio then, talk? Who's a TV talk show guy that? Uh promoted the great controversy on his show. Somebody everybody knows. You remember that? Yeah. Uh, I can't well, remember. Yeah. yeah. Was it Rush Limbaugh or somebody like that? Yeah, I used to get those guys Something. mixed up. They don't mean anything yeah, one to of those me. Guys. I never watch them. I don't think it's It Rush was Limbaugh. when the great controversy Yeah, I know. I know. The great I, I know. I know. Being yeah. broadcast in the city of Los Angeles or something. Yeah, yeah, I just can't remember the guy's name, but it, yeah. So he was, yeah, you know, saying people. That was interesting. Be. He was, and he was, I guess, getting copies to people too. If you wanted a copy, he'd get you a copy. But yeah, but the point is here is that we see that uh, people's attention is drawn. To this, so ruler, statesmen, men who occupy positions of trust and authority, thinking men and women of all classes, so they have their attention fixed on the events taking place, and that's much more true of today than it was in Ellen White's day. Right? People know that you know something is amiss. You know something's afoot. It's it's there's things going on that are 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 really unprecedented. 
They are watching the relations that exist among the nations. They observe the intensity that is taking possession of every earthly element. And they recognize that something great and decisive is about to take place, that the world is on the verge of a stupendous crisis. And, and that's definitely true of today. It, it wouldn't be as true in the 1970s. I mean, obviously, you know, during the Second and First World Wars, you could say that there was a, a, a stupendous crisis, stupendous, but not to even the extent of what we see here now. I mean, we're looking at something like a civil war in the United States that, that could end the United States as a nation. You know, that's definitely a lot different than what happened in, in the 20th century with the First and Second World War. Of course, if you were German or in other countries, it, it, it would be a serious thing. But as far as, you know, Bible prophecy is concerned, uh, we're seeing something that is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And then we had Adventists in Seventh day Adventists in that time of the First and Second World Wars. Do you have any uh, history on how they were thinking of it? I would have thought it was just like the time of trouble or almost or little time of trouble. Um, well, the Sunday law wasn't tied to it, so yeah, yeah, I mean, the whole world they, they definitely, um, you know, paid attention to it, right? I mean, obviously, you have this. Um, okay, yeah, we get somebody here. I'm gonna do this. I think in Germany, I think in Germany, they uh, the church folded under Hitler. I think. Yeah, d don't worry about that stuff. That's not important. Okay, let's change that topic. Okay, so let's go on here. A storm, a storm is arising that will wrench and test the spiritual foundation of everyone. To the utmost. So 5T129. 8T315. A storm is coming, relentless in its fury. Are we prepared to meet it? And from Evangelism 361, 362. The storm is coming, a storm that will try every man's faith of what sort it is. Believers must now be firmly rooted in Christ, or else they will be led astray by some phase of error. Let your faith be substantiated by the word of God. Grasp firmly the living testimony of truth. Have faith in Christ as a personal savior. He has been and ever will be our rock of ages. Yeah. So if you're having trouble, somebody's just saying they're having trouble with the volume. Uh, I don't, nobody's having trouble with the volume, are they? Of my voice? No, I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. So it'd be something with your, either your computer. So. Anyway, so here we have these storms, a storm arising, uh, which will, that will wrench and test the spiritual foundation of everyone to the utmost. Um, now I don't think these are all talking about the same storm. I mean, she's using the word storm here. Now the one in five testimonies, 129. So I think this is, if I remember correctly, because I, I, I recently went, well, Heidi and I went through. Uh, five testimonies. So when you read through five testimonies, she's talking often about the condition of the church. And uh, let me see if I can find this here. Yeah. So I'm just reading this through here. Yeah, she talks about how um, Caleb's are the men most needed in these last days, that which will make our churches vigorous and successful in their efforts not to is not bustle, but quiet, humble work, not parade and bombast, but patient, prayerful, persevering effort. So the whole context here is about the work in the church. So that's the context of the article. And then we got uh, in this one in evangelism play page, uh, 361 and 362. Um, and I don't know where that originally is taken from because evangelism is a compilation. So <clears throat> I'm going to see where it's taken from. That's one thing I hate about the, these compilations here. You know, he's not giving where it's actually originally from. from. And, and so it's... Um, <clears throat> 
Oh, the storm is coming. Where is this? I don't see it here. Um, okay, that's... Um, this is taken from Review and Herald, August 31st, 1905. Yeah, the context here really has to do with false doctrine coming into the church. So there's this part here where it says, The fallacies of Satan are now being multiplied, and those who swerve from the path of truth will lose their bearings, having nothing to which to, which to anchor. They will drift from one delusion to another, blown about by the winds of strange doctrines. Satan has come down with great power. Many will be deceived by his miracles. Now, you know, there's the context here, of course, within the world, but also definitely within Adventism. The one thing that I've seen in the time that I've been a Seventh-day Adventist is that there has been, there was not so many winds of doctrine as you know, in the 1980s, 1990s, as there are today. So everybody's got this, this these winds of doctrine and they, they make it difficult to present something like what we present without people being frightened about it, right? So, and there are people presenting some things that we are presenting, but in fanaticism, you know, there's uh, this one guy, um, can't think of his name. I'm going to find it um, because his video showed up in my... YouTube, he's completely enmeshed in fanaticism. Uh, so he's got a video called The Commencement of the Tra Chain of Truth. His, his, his YouTube page is the fourth angel's message. For the first time. And, and uh, his, um, let me see here, what is his name? Andrew Mosman, right? So Andrew Mosman, this guy, and, and these people believed, you know, for instance, that the eclipse did not occur. I'm pretty sure it's the same, same people that, that, that eclipse of the sun was fake. And they're warning people not to go outside because you're going to be deceived. Uh, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. And of course, they promote uh, historic Adventism, false teachings regarding the Godhead, false teachings regarding... Really? Um, Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. What I, find, what? What, I found what I found interesting is that they were not alone in that that, that conspiracy theory of the eclipse. Uh, so many people thought it was a conspiracy. Yes. Yeah, that, that these eclipses. Much, much exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's crazy. I mean, we're, it's. But, but that's the type of stuff that people are being deceived by within Adventism. And. Uh, you know, and so if you, if you, I mean, the thing why I noticed this, um, because the page that they have, um, like the title page for their video, the commencement of the chain of truth is one of the charts with the prophetic mirror on there. The two 2520s with the 19 years, 46 years. So it's something from our movement they're using for the picture. Uh, so it's a counterfeit of what, what we are doing that is there. Well, it's an offshoot, I guess. But they're way off course. Was he, the name, the name, the name sounds familiar. W would he have been connected with the Alabama group at all? No. Okay. It sounds familiar. Uh, no, he's or, in Oregon. Or Jamaica or the, where? He's in Oregon. Where? Oh, Oregon. okay. Yeah. The Pacific Northwest not the South. Okay. So anyway, there's all kinds of errors that, that are being promoted. And, um, you know, it's just, that, that's, that, that's the context anyway, that, that I have of, of that statement. So she talks about a storm. She uses the storm as an analogy in different, different situations. Um, and then we have a tempest. It's a type of storm again. God has revealed what is to take place in the last days, that his people may be prepared to stand against the temp tempest of opposition and wrath. The tempest is coming. We must get ready for its fury by having repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord will arise to shake terribly the earth. We shall see troubles on all sides. Thousands of ships will be hurled into the depths of the sea. 
Navies will go down and human lives will be sacrificed by millions. Fires will break out unexpectedly and no human effort will be able to quench them. The palaces of earth will be swept away in the fury of the flames. Disasters by rail will become more and more frequent. Confusion, collision, and death, without a moment's warning, will occur on the great lines of travel. The end is near. Probation is closing. Oh, let us seek God while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. So that's messages to young people, page 89 and 90. Now, of course, again, you know, emphasize that Ella White's talking about our time. And, and we can see that these things have happened in the past. But what she's talking about is something that's really unprecedented. And, and so we are to look to see that this is going to occur. Things are going to occur that if, on a scale that has never been seen before. The most terrible conflict ever witnessed. And so the conflict that is right upon us will be the most terrible ever witnessed. Six testimonies, 407. So... Now, some people might say, well, you know, that was, um, you know, the First World War, which was pretty terrible, you know. But I don't think that that's what she's just talking about. I think she's still speaking about in our time, a fearful conflict. Satan is marshalling his hosts, and we are individually, and are we individually prepared for the fearful conflict that is just before us? Are we preparing our children for the great crisis? So it's something, you know, to think about, to be prepared. And, and this is not meant, to, you know, to scare us. It's There's just a reality of what's happened. Um, said, is, yeah. Is this the same book that you send every month? Um, I put it on, on the Unity chat. Yeah, is that the same book? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I was, I was trying to figure out. If the believers in the truth are not sustained by their faith in these comparatively peaceful days, what will uphold them when the grand test comes and the decree, decree goes forth against all, all those who will not worship the image of the beast and receive his mark in their foreheads or in their hands? The solemn period is not far off. Instead of becoming weak and irresolute, the people of God should be gathering strength and courage for the time of trouble. Now, we have a tendency in human nature. Well, the crisis isn't here. I got time. Um, and we can be quite lax in, in, you know, how we, in our prayer, in our study, in our Sabbath keeping, in, in our morals. You know, we think that we can somehow get prepared later on. That, well, when the crisis occurs, then I will get ready. I mean, People actually think those types of things, but somehow that they can just put it off. And I don't, I don't know how we can draw that conclusion that that's somehow safe and a, a great terror. Transgression has almost reached its limit. Confusion fills the world and a great terror is soon to come upon human beings. The end is near. So, so we can see that a crisis Ellen White talks about a crisis that's coming, and we can see that we are in that crisis. Now, Kelly asked the question, what keeps us from being lax? Well, can you answer that question? Yeah, uh, I like your answers better, <laughs> but uh, you'll smooth it out for me. In my experience, it, it is a, uh, it's like I read something recently about our very words will seem vile to us. And when I hear myself speaking sometimes, I think, oh, boy, you know, and it's that experience where uh, I guess we, you've described it already. The, the way we come to Christ is the way we need to live every day. And that's we have to come to him every day the same way we came to him when we first came to him. Yeah. yeah. And so how did we first come to him? We came to him with a sense of our need. And mm -hmm. uh, I guess maybe having a keeping what helps keep me from being lax lately is a daily awareness of, uh, of my need and being able to see me for what I am uh, through the Holy Spirit. 
in mm-hmm. weeks. Well, well, message of mercy is to to Laodicea too. And, you know, and God in His mercy, all, yeah, and God in His mercy brings us trials. Now, some of those trials are are self caused, right? I mean, we we and and uh, uh, how He uses the trials to whether self caused or not. Yeah, to allow the consequences to have a full effect. Yeah, before so, so before they burn it up. Yeah, so I mean, there's a part obviously. Yeah, we seek God, right? Because we feel our need, and 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 God, you know, we feel our need because our need becomes evident, right? Now, you know, I, I always wonder how some people just can. Um, I mean, everybody must see their need. I mean, I even think back to when, you know, I had wandered away from God, you know, back in the 1990s. It was a difficult time for me. It's just kind of going through the motions. I was discouraged and um, still doing, you know, Sabbath school, teaching Sabbath school every Sabbath. But I was exhausted. You know, I was overworked late 1990s. Um, And uh, but I knew I needed a change. Right. I knew something had to happen. So I asked God to destroy my life and rebuild it again. And of course he did. He destroyed my life. Right. And, uh, and, and then rebuilt it the way that he wanted to rebuild it. And now, you know, I'm in, in a sense, in the midst of a crisis again, very similar to what I went through in the late nineties and early two thousands. But it's a different, a different attitude about this crisis. You know, I'm not crushed by it. Which, which is hopeful, uh, but still, it's still a trial. You know, there's still trials there. But I can see that God can bring us through things when we're connected with him, that when we're not connected with him, it's much more difficult. And, you know, and God, so, so we grow in grace and uh, in dependence upon God. So... Uh, when I look at this here, just hang on. So what keeps us from being laxed? Lax is the question. And it, it's really just a response to the Holy Spirit. Are we going to respond? I mean, it's it's kind of like, well, how do you start things going? God is going to bring things in your life that are going to make you aware that you have a need. And are you going to heed that? what God is showing you or not. So some of us have deadened our senses because of all the entertainment and all the things that we do that keep us busy. And uh, we just put it off. We just uh, don't want to look at that unpleasant reality. You know, I was going to say, uh, sorry, Uh, I was going to say that the other wonderful thing about God, bringing things to our life to make us aware of our need is that he brings us over the same ground over and over. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Faithfully. Yeah, that's mercy. Yeah. And so, <clears throat> yeah, don't lose hope. Don't lose hope. Yeah. Well, and it goes back to this question in, in the previous study about, um, you know, our sins, you know, and these, you know, God allows us to stumble and fall you know he he bring, he puts us into situations that are going to show us I, I can't remember the statement but uh in spirit of prophecy where it is or anything and, and exactly how it's worded but basically he will allow us to see to fall so that we can see our sinfulness right in some ways we'll be surprised at the things that we do um because we we haven't been aware of how far away we are from god how unlike Christ we are. So, so God has to allow us to see this. And so, you know, these are, these are the trials we go through, you know, ones that we can say are self-caused, you know, our own sins, um, because God allows it, right? Not so that we can be lost, but so that we can be saved. That's why I dislike this whole thing about, you know, just one little sin, you know, as if, you know, God's just watching for us to commit some sin and then, oh, your probation's closed. Now you're lost because God sometimes allows us to sin so that we can truly repent. 
right? He brings us into circumstances that our our sin becomes evident to us. Just like he did with and, and David. I would add that God, and I would add that God always allows us to sin. Yeah. That's a freedom. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes, he always allows it. But sometimes I'm saying in the sense of allow, he brings us into situations that will, in a sense, show us something about ourselves that we wouldn't have seen otherwise. Okay. Like, for instance, I think right away of uh, being in an argument with someone and getting angry and the worst of me comes out of my mouth. That that's like that, a temptation to. Yeah, well, well, I I think of of King David. So we say, well, King David's a man after God's own heart, right? But David, when he committed uh, adultery and then murder, it wasn't like that. He just stumbled upon that, right? There was something him in him already that God needed to reveal to him. Uh, so I mean. God, you know, could have stopped that from happening, right? Uh, Bathsheba, you know, didn't necessarily need to be bathing on the roof there that David could see her, right? But there's something already that David had done in his life. I mean, he had many concubines and so forth, right? So he had already tended away from God and wasn't aware of his, his spiritual danger. So God allowed that snare to capture him. Now, it, it, you know, it made it so that David couldn't be the one to build the temple and, and, uh, and so forth. I mean, it's part of it, but it also uh, affected his, you know, he was also a man of war. So that's another issue, but, uh, it, it weakened his influence. It, there was a long term effect of that, of, of his sin. So, you know, God allows these things to happen. But what I'm trying to say is that everything that happens is in God's providence. That we can't look at our failures as, you know, just as, you know, that God hasn't perceived them, that he doesn't know about them. Because he is there ready to save at all times. And, and so he has allowed this world to be a world of sin. For his purposes, right? His eternal purposes. And we need to recognize that. We need to recognize that all of these things that happen to us, that God has foreseen them and that he is there to save and that we need to seek him. We need to cling to him as Jacob did to Christ. And, um, so I like, you know, I like what I like what you say about our mistakes and so on. Or even taking our sin that we choose. And God takes it a curse and makes it a blessing in our lives and in the lives of others. He can do that. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's 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 kind of seems, you know, like it shouldn't be that way. But 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 God is not there to glorify man, right? So often we, we want to be glorified. You know, we're, we're focused upon our salvation and us appearing good. And, uh, you know, in the end, we, we don't take any glory to ourselves because it, it is all of Christ. All glory goes to him. And and we just often don't understand that. We want to see ourselves as righteous. Anyway, that, that is that is the blessing I see coming from the curse is God is revealed. Yeah. In our in, in our, our redemption. Yeah, because that's all that really matters. Okay, so we'll pick this up next week, um, at number three. Uh, but so let's uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study here um, on this Sabbath morning, and I pray for each person that you can be with them through the rest of the Sabbath, that you can continue. Uh, to reveal to us our need of you and that we can forsake our sins and that we can trust in you. We know that there is an opportunity to share with those around us who see what's happening in this world. And we just pray, Lord, that we can be a reflection of Christ's character and that we can speak words uh, that will draw people to you. Thank you for hearing our prayer. 
May your angels continue to watch over us and our loved ones. And may your Holy Spirit continue to speak to their hearts. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.